After hundreds of heroes from other worlds were summoned to fight the darkness and its powerful army of demons, this young man was rejected as a hero and left in another world, abandoned in the farthest corners of the kingdom by a cruel king who only wanted to be rid of him. The fate of this hero seems very bleak, but what will happen when he discovers that he has a hidden supernatural power that manifests later? The episode begins when this hero is summoned to this world as candidate number 98. They say, welcome, hero Banaza, to our magical land of Krayrod. Please come here. He asks where he is and what this place exactly is. Where am I? I was in the loading area. What is my purpose? What is my job? This girl speaks to him and says, Sir Banaza, the other candidate hero will be summoned soon. Come here quickly. He asks who this other person is, and she tells him, I will show you how to measure your power using the crystal ball. He is surprised to find that he has a power and says to her, There is something wrong in this place. Despite you saying that I am a huge candidate, I am just an assistant. She tells him, You may not know that there is a hidden power within you. Come and take a look at our land, Krayrod. Then she asks him what kind of country he lived in, because our country is in a completely different world altogether. After all, he opens the window and sees the beauty of this country. He marvels and says, I have never heard of a country known by this name. I wonder if it is trading relations with another country or what. Then he says to himself, it seems that I am in a different world from the one I was in. Then this girl speaks and says, because of the long battles against the army of demons, the kingdom was on the verge of collapse and everything was about to bow down to it. So our city decided to summon heroes from a different world. These heroes are capable of defeating the demon king and resisting the invasion. He says to her, I really don't know about that, but isn't it better to appoint someone strong as a hero only from this country? After that, he enters this room, the room where all the wizards are gathered, surrounded by the crystal ball. The girl says, those who have been brought to this world from another world are given blessings from heaven and are granted skills that no one else can obtain. Then she tells him, this is the way from here. And indeed, he stands before this crystal. Then afterward, the magical crystal begins to glow revealing that his power is very weak. Energy 9, Defense 8, Ability 6, Magical Strength 1, and he has no supernatural abilities. The girl is shocked and says to him, you don't possess life force or any supernatural power. These are abilities of an average adult male and you don't have any extraordinary abilities. Then Banaza speaks and says, this is true. I told you I'm just a merchant. The wizards around them consider this a great failure and demand to return this failure to his world immediately. We must search again for a suitable hero, they say. However, the other says to him, the transport gate has already been closed. Then we see this servant girl who says, a legendary man similar to you with powers exceeding 999 in magic energy and physical strength has appeared. He seems a bit arrogant and he says he was chosen to save the world people flock around him saying, you are truly our hero. Please wait, save us, we will be saved by this hero. We were told that the hero will save us all. Then the king announces that this hero with blonde hair is the chosen warrior. Everyone starts celebrating, ignoring the other young man. He wonders what they are doing. So everyone starts ignoring him, saying it's a feast and they give him a drink. Then he goes to the girl he met earlier and asks her what will happen. Do you remember me? I was chosen as the candidate hero. She is shocked to see him and says, so why are you still in this world? He tells her no one told me how to return. She then explains that it's very difficult to summon a candidate hero if the gate is closed and it's highly unlikely that the gate will open again for him to return to his original world. Banaza is shocked by this and says, impossible. If I can't return, then he talks to the king about the issue of the unqualified candidate hero. The king admits that failing to return him to his world was a grave mistake and orders him to be expelled from the country. While in the carriage, he recalls the king's words, apologizing on behalf of the entire state of Krayrod, saying, Stay in the Delaves forest in the north. I will give you a special permit to live in this world. After that, we see him in the carriage talking to the carriage driver, but the driver tells him, Sorry, I've been told not to speak with you. However, at this time, it's hard not to talk please. Then he asks who he is and the driver tells him that it's his job. Banaza is surprised because there were no lower species than humans he could interact with in his world. Other species were classified as slaves. The driver says, we're not slaves, but this is my job. Banaza realizes, indeed, I came from a different world. 
Then we see Banaza before being summoned to another world. And his friend asks him, is this all your luggage? It seems they are in a loading area, and he talks to the man who says there might be 45 additional boxes, depending on negotiation. The man asks him to wait a little while they prepare breakfast. Then we see people around Banaza, amazed, saying, this man is giving money to non-humans. He should have given it to his ally. These individuals might start thinking that they will be given money as well. Then we see Banaza's friend, who is not human, telling him, I am part of the demon tribe. You are not obligated to pay us. Then he gives him the money again, but Banaza tells him, You wait until you trade with me. If I don't pay you, this will leave a bad feeling. Then this girl comes and says, Please agree, Sir Banaza. If he decides to do something, he won't stop until it's done. Then we see different species rejoicing over what Banaza did, saying, We will all follow Mr. Banaza. They are pleased with him. Then Banaza speaks to the girl named Quinn and says, You saved me. She replies, I always help you, don't I? But we see humans around him upset about what Banaza is doing because he treats other species well. Banaza thinks to himself, I wonder if there is a world without discrimination between humans and other species. Then we see Quinn saying, there are a few people in the kingdom who say that. People don't want others to invest in anything. Banaza says, I don't think it's strange. You have friends of different kinds. Then a strong glow appears and Banaza disappears from this world, astonishing Quinn because she doesn't see him anymore. We return to the present time, and Banaza has arrived in this forest. The carriage driver tells him, my orders are to bring you here. This is the Delave's forest. Banaza says to him, it was a pleasant 20-day journey with you. Thank you. The carriage driver warns him about rumors of demons lurking around this area and advises him to be careful. Then he leaves in the carriage. Banaza thinks to himself, there hasn't been any village or even a person in sight for 20 days of travel. They gave me one magical bag as an apology. Does this bag contain a treasure? I don't know. Let's see what's inside. He opens it and finds 100,000 metal coins, a house, 20 sets of clothes, 8 sets of weapons, and 3 sets of agricultural tools. Banaza realizes he can build a house now and won't worry about food and shelter for some time. He takes out the sword and says, This sword seems very exquisite for fighting the demon army. Then a wild beast appears, attacking him. Banaza cuts it into pieces, but when he does, his sword breaks. It seems Banaza's level has increased, and an infinity sign appears with each of Banaza's skills. Banaza wonders about it and says, What is this sign? What does it mean? When I was at the palace, my stats were very low. Maybe I couldn't read all the characters in their language. Banaza seems unaware that this infinity sign means his abilities have increased unbelievably. Then he is surprised to hear a voice that says to him, the special abilities of skills will now activate. He marvels at having gained very powerful abilities and says, with so many abilities, I won't be able to remember them all. Then he receives a warning from the system about discovering hidden magic, a magic that attracts nearby monsters. He realizes he can cancel this monster attracting magic, so he deletes this technique. After that, he begins to search for a living area and realizes that this forest is contaminated with dangerous magic. A message appears asking him if he wants to purify this magic and cleanse the forest. He responds, all right, if I can do it, I'll do it. I wonder how much magical power I have left as I must live here. Then he notices that the forest has indeed started to purify and rid itself of the magic. After that, in the palace, the king's daughter comes to him and says, even if he's not useful, this is very cruel, father. Why did you banish the other hero? She explains to him that the forest is the demon's habitat, their base for creating their soldiers, and that he told him to live there. Banaza says, this is more than necessary for us too, especially for him to fight the demon army, especially since he's a failed hero. Then news comes to him from one of his followers that the highest sacred magic has been summoned and activated. The king says so the blonde hero has managed to do it after leaving and starting his training. He managed to perform the highest sacred skill, which takes 100 years of talent. This is definitely his right to be recognized as the hero. But the servant tells him that the sacred magic didn't come from him. But from the south, where the hero was headed, they spotted him from the forest and the blonde hero hadn't reached there yet. So they are surprised by this. After that, we learn that the purification magic is the highest level of magic for cleansing black magic cells that affect human bodies. It can destroy the demon's bodies from the inside. 
It's usually used by gathering all the kingdom's sorcerers together. It's the ultimate magical weapon. Then we see Banaza on the opposite side of the forest saying, the forest has become calm. He wonders how to check what's left of his mana using the purification magic. He thinks his magical power has decreased, but he's surprised when his magical power and stats return to what they were before. It seems he has reached level 367, and his magical powers are still infinite. He wonders why his level is increasing only from using magic, and why the strange symbol hasn't changed. It seems the statistic screen is disabled. But he remembers the words of the palace servant, saying that she mentioned that my stat screen shows an average magic level. I believe my magical power is very low, to the point that the screen displays it incorrectly, and it's annoying not to show it. After that, he turns off the notifications and says, I hope there are no serious damages. He is also informed by the screen that the forest has become pure because of his magic, and purification is complete. He's not allowed to live in the city, because if he goes there, they'll kill him if they see him enter and leave the castle. Then he receives a notification that he can use transformation magic to change his appearance. He begins to transform into a woman, but he reverts to himself as he was before and says, even if I enter and leave the city, no one will notice that I'm Beneza. Then he says the problem now is the distance to the city. I'll need 20 days by carriage. But at this moment, he receives a notification asking if he wants to move to the castle using spatial magic. He is surprised to find that he has arrived at the city using this magic, and Banaza is astonished by that. He says, in my world, only high-level sorcerers can use teleportation magic. Here, even ordinary people can use it. This spatial magic allows transportation by specifying a previously visited area, and there is also the possibility of transporting a group of people at once. He then tries to return to his world using spatial magic, but it doesn't respond, and he says, as I expected, it's impossible to return to my world. Well, then I must start earning money to live. Then he says, I'll go to the guild in this world. Maybe I can do some work like pest control or guarding, but it's too early to join the adventurer's guild. Then he receives a notification that the city of Krayerud is the hero's association. He continues walking forward and says, it's a comfortable world. Indeed. Then he enters the adventurer's guild and the girl there says, the adventurer's levels are determined by their performance. If your level increases, you can take harder missions suitable for your level. You can also take missions even if you're not a member of the guild, but your compensation will be lower by joining the Heroes Association. We offer you free treatment for your injuries with our Sorcerer's Origin. We advise you to register. What do you think about this? Banaza says the guild structure is similar to what exists in my world. Then he agrees with her, and she says, okay, please pay one silver coin as a registration fee. He says, I haven't received any silver coins from the palace. Is it possible to pay with a gold coin? She says, yes, there's no problem. Does a gold coin equal 10 silver coins? It's difficult to accept this money since I haven't worked to deserve it. Then she asks him what his name is, and he remembers the words of the palace servant, that even if he changes his appearance, if he carries the same name, it will be a problem. So he tells her, register my name as Folio. After that, this little girl appears to him and asks him, can you guard me until I reach the Delafaza forest? I want a personal guard. The adventurers around him reply, Little girl, no one wants to go on a 20-day journey. If you have a carriage and provide food, I'm ready to accept your request. Folio hears this conversation and says, Isn't this the forest I was in before? Then he goes to meet the girl and asks her, Do you mind if I take you there? She responds, The reward you offered isn't high. Is this suitable for you? He says, Okay, I've been to the Delafaza forest before. If you just want to go, I can send you there using spatial magic. These adventurers are astonished by that and say, it's impossible for this little guy to use teleportation magic. He should have thought of a better lie. They say an adventurer of the E rank thinks he can use teleportation magic. Suddenly, this girl appears and says she's his royal guard, brandishing her sword towards him, and tells him to stay away from this girl immediately. She said, I told you that you could use spatial magic but I don't see you as an advanced sorcerer who can use this type of magic. What's your goal? A few days ago, no one accepted her request and now someone wants to take it without much compensation. This is suspicious. Then this girl speaks and says, maybe you aim to harm her body or kidnap or enslave or engage in human trafficking. Folio says, it would be bad if anyone from the palace found out and they seem to suspect me a lot. 
I have to clarify this misunderstanding quickly. He says to them, why don't we all go together? And you can also get all the rewards for yourselves. The Royal Knight speaks and says, if you make any suspicious move, I will kill you quickly. He tells her, of course. Then they move to a place where no one can see them and say, okay, let's do it. They start executing the teleportation technique to the forest. They are surprised when they actually arrive at the forest and they say, this is surprising. This place is definitely the Delafaza forest. The little sorceress who is with them speaks and says, teleportation magic over such a long distance can only be done by people of the highest levels of magic. Folio says, I'm just an ordinary adventurer. At least I can use this type of magic. But the knightess tells him she doubts it. Then she sits down and apologizes to him. He tells her it's okay since it was a misunderstanding. Then the little girl asks, why did all the demon particles disappear? This forest was supposed to be covered in demon particles. Then Folio almost speaks, saying he did it. But he receives notifications that it's dangerous to tell anyone from the demon faction about his purification magic. He says demons and humans aren't in agreement. They're surprised to find out that this girl is a demon with the fangs of a wolf. And the active magic currently is transformation into a human. After that, the knightness steps forward and says to the little girl, it's time to reveal your identity, miss. They all begin to aim their weapons at her, and the girl says she wants to go to the demon forest to settle there. The situation seems suspicious, and they say they were skeptical about it. The knightess says that Castle Crayrod received a report from the Adventurer's Guild a few days ago that someone was recruiting people to go with him to this forest, and there was a suspicious girl. Then the little girl speaks in a terrifying manner and says she is the younger sister of one of the four priests of the demon king, Fenjero. Then she transforms into a ferocious wolf and says she is Fenless. She tells Folio, you will regret your decision and you will all die now. She says to him, I will eliminate these people so that you will be my last prey. Then she starts attacking the Nightnies, but Folio saves her at the last moment. He asks her what exactly is happening here and asks if this is a type of magic. Then the monster attacks him again, and he says, at least you seem to have a little courage, but he avoids its attack again and says it's impossible to escape, as he has to protect four people. He remembers that when he used the technology magic, even without touching the screen, the magic activated when he thought about pressing the button. He starts activating the teleportation magic and successfully transports the four. The wolf is surprised and asks, where did they go? The girl wolf says, my brother entrusted me with this, and I wanted to feed them to the leaders. Why are you the only one left? Are you planning to become food for me alone? He tells her, okay, I really don't think I want to die after all. And so the first episode of this anime ends. Stay tuned, but don't forget to subscribe to the channel and activate the bell button to receive all the latest updates. Hello, this is Tanjiro Recaps channel for summarizing the world of anime. I hope you enjoy watching. Let's now continue with the new episode of the wonderful anime and archdemon's dilemma, how to love your elf bride. When the sorcerer Zagan decides to participate in an auction selling the goods of the now dead archdemon Marcosias, he expects to find items of untold power. What he finds instead is a rare white-haired slave elf named Nephelia, and he immediately spends all his money to purchase her, much to the bewilderment of those around him. However, the secret reason behind Zagan's investment was that he had actually fallen in love with her at first sight. Hello, this is Tanjiro Recaps channel for summarizing the world of anime. I hope you enjoy watching. Let's now continue with the new episode of the wonderful anime Kamiwe Game Ni Wetero. Our episode begins with a massive ice storm, during which there's a sudden explosion, revealing a boy trapped within a block of ice in this ice age. Surprise guards witness this, and one of them asks for help from the mystery agency. The girl inside the ice speaks up, warning that this is not good at all, and asks if it's been 1,000 years or 2,000 years. The guard falls to the ground, bewildered, and asks her who she is. She dismisses it as unimportant and requests the best player in this era. The scene shifts to the girl on a plane, seemingly in a game called Monster Games, wondering which monster will challenge humanity today. People worldwide tune in to witness this historic moment. Then we see the boy named Vi with a travel bag, reflecting that six months have passed since his return here. He questions if this is the Monster Games and how three monsters will unite. We enter the game and witness the heroes chasing and defeating monsters. Back to Vi, he declares it's time to go as he's ultimately united. Then we see two sons talking 
and one asks if that's Vi. Upon seeing Vi, he grabs his bag and leaves hastily. We transition to the branch office of the Mystery Agency, where everyone is astonished by Vi's entrance. The Secretary General Miranda stands before Va, welcoming him and teasing about his weight loss over the six months. Vi smiles and asks what's going on here. Miranda chuckles, asking if it's clear that the girl they spent six months searching for was the wrong person. Vi asks Miranda, didn't you say you found someone who looks exactly like her? Miranda replies that she heard rumors about finding someone resembling her. Then she asks Vi to accompany her to the 17th floor because she wants to discuss the game between humanity and the creatures of the other world. We see Vi and Miranda in the elevator, where Miranda tells him that the redhead girl instructed the guards to bring the best player of this era. Vi asks Miranda about this girl, and Miranda informs him that she's from another world. A year ago, they extracted a monster in the form of a girl from perpetual ice and conducted experiments in a hall beneath the sea while playing the chase game with some humans. However, while she was hiding, she fell into a deep sleep and transferred directly to the Ice Age, where she has been frozen for the past 3,000 years. She appears to embody fire in the form of a dragon and claims to be a former demon whose powers have waned, but is still dangerous. Miranda advises Vi not to anger her as she can hide the city from the face of the earth within an hour and turn it into ashes. Vi asks Miranda, why do you keep such a dangerous demon like her? Miranda explains that they didn't know she was dangerous to that extent at first. They reach the 17th floor and Miranda informs Vi that he will be monitoring the girl. As they walk together, Miranda tells him about higher spiritual beings descending to earth, but they still don't know the reason. They stand in front of the girl's door and Miranda tells Vi that she wants to understand why the girl is still here, but they must not anger her when they enter to avoid getting into serious trouble. That's why Vi is perfect for this task, as he's the only one who can do it without risking death. Vi asks if that's because he can't die, and Miranda confirms, explaining that the monster's power is immense and they can easily destroy humans. So she requested him because he possesses abilities that prevent him from dying. Miranda then opens the door and looks at Vi, telling him he'll have to show off a bit, but not to worry. He won't be alone. They enter the room filled with various games, and Vi remarks that the girl seems to love games a lot. Then Vi approaches the game and takes the dice, saying four and six. He rolls the dice, and we see that both dice show four and six, as Vi said. Miranda is surprised and asks if it's a coincidence. Vi explains to her that it's easy for him. He just ensures that the desired side of the numbers is facing up, before tossing them with enough force to make them flip halfway in the air. Suddenly, the redhead girl named Ryuri Susama appears, and Vi seems to reminisce about the past, where she appears to have been his teacher. Then we return to reality, and the girl asks Miranda about this boy. Miranda informs her that he's the best player in the era she requested, having won three games since last year, making him an elite. He's appointed as the supervisor from today onwards. During their conversation, we see Vei looking very surprised and silent. He remarks that the girl resembles his teacher a lot. Ruru Su then asks if he's all right. Miranda informs them that she needs to get back to work and suggests they get to know each other. She puts her hand on Vaya's shoulder, telling him not to ruin his new supervisor position. Then she approaches Ryuri Su and tells her that they're going to play a game. Vi asks why they don't introduce themselves first. He hopes they can get to know each other since he'll be supervising them. Ryurisu tells him that they'll get to know each other through the game. We see them standing in front of the table, starting the game. There are many cards on the table, each with a question written on it, such as age, name, birthplace, hobbies, and dreams. Ryurisu tells Vi that she named this game Self-Introduction Memory, and the rules are the same as a regular memory game, but instead of matching numbers, they'll match self-introduction topics. For example, if they match birthplace, they should answer with their birthplace, and if there's no match, there's no need to answer. She gathers all the cards and shuffles them again. Vi asks why she's shuffling the cards when they were all face up on the table. Yurisu is surprised and asks him if he remembers the position of every card and saw how she shuffled them. Vi tells her that it's one of his habits, as he was trained by someone until death to play games. Rurusu looks at him and says she's impressed, especially by his unwillingness to cheat, as he remembered all the cards and wanted to play fairly. In that case, maybe they shouldn't play this game on such a small table. Then she looks at the cards in her hand and orders them to spin. Suddenly, all the cards start spinning in the air, surprising Vi greatly. 
He asks if all the cards move in different orbits and speeds. Ryurisu explains that each card has a different orbit, so they don't know how they'll wrap around, making it more fun. Vi looks at the cards and talks to himself, saying that once he reveals a card, he'll never forget its position, just like her. So she added a rule to keep changing the positions of the cards. Ryurisu tells Vi that she wants to add a special rule. The one-turn rule. In a typical memory game, we usually get another turn if we match a pair. But in this game, that won't happen. Vi remarks that among all the games, this rule will be annoying, meaning it's no longer just a memory game. They start the game, and the scene shifts to Miranda sitting in her office, watching Vey and Ryurisu through surveillance cameras. She comments that the game has begun. Then we return to Vi and Ryurisu, where Ryurisu tells him he can start first. Vi chooses two cards and sees that they have birthplace and blood type written on them. He wonders if demons inherently have blood. Ryurisu tells him that their blood is hotter than magma, and if there's even a single drop, this whole building will melt. If he wants to know more, he should make sure to match the blood type cards. Then it's Ryurisu's turn, and she chooses two cards. We see that they have birthplace and name written on them, so there's no match. She looks at Vi and informs him that they've just drawn the birthplace cards. Vi tells her that the card she just drew is behind him, as it's the second card from the back among the four cards they flipped previously, and its position is the third from the right among the six cards spinning by the window. Then Vi draws the cards, and we see that the two matching cards both have birthplace written on them. Ryurisu gets excited and tells him that she'll answer and all the gods share the same answer. She tells him that she was from Elements, a place humans call the spiritual dimension. It's a place where non-human entities reside, and humans need a special gate to enter there. Vi tells her that he knows about it, as he used it six months ago. Then we see Miranda informing us that the monsters are thirsty for games because they feel bored. They gave the Arises to humans so they could challenge them in games. Humans who receive the arises from monsters become messengers and can challenge monsters in battles of wit, either using superhuman or magical powers. All monster games will take place in elements. As a reward for winning a game, messengers can use a portion of their arises in the real world. This power is essential for exploring undiscovered lands, as 93 of the world is hostile and unexplored. In monster games, messengers lose their right to play after three losses and get terminated after ten victories. The humanity is tasked with ending the game. But so far, no human has achieved that feat. Then the scene shifts back to Vi, who tells Ryurisu that he was slightly surprised by her lack of hesitation in answering. Ryurisu tells Vi that it's just one of the rules of the game. Rules aren't just restrictions. Then it's Ryurisu's turn to draw two cards, and we see that the cards have name written on them. She asks Vi about his name, and he tells her that his name is Vey Theo Phelps, brought to her by the Secretary General Miranda. She then asks him about his title, and he tells her that no one has ever called him anything other than Vi before. Vi then thinks to himself and says he believes that titles are also part of the name card, and it would be appropriate to add something else to the self-introduction game. He wonders what question could come to mind from the matching cards. If you're smart enough, you can extend the scope of questions as you wish. But this isn't just a card drawing game. Even if you know where the cards are, not selecting some cards will lead to my victory. This is a game of information where we have choices in each turn. And I'm confident I know where the cards I need are. All that's left is what you're aiming for. Then it's Ryurisu's turn, but the two cards she draws have nothing written on them. Meaning anyone who gets them can ask any question they want. Then Leo Ishii looked at the two papers and asked him if he remembered their first promise. Then suddenly her eyes shifted, and she asked him what the real reason behind his attempt to get close to her was. Faye is very surprised and Leo Ishii asks him to answer, because she won't allow him to lie in answering my question. So Faye thinks to himself that she is a real devil indeed. Then he remembers memories from the past, and says that all games are fun if you have someone to play with. They had the same goal from the beginning while they were playing the game normally, and they were actually aiming for the two wild cards. Then he tells her that he was seeking that, because he knew that a devil like her would discover the motives of the General Secretary Miranda, but he didn't mind since he played a fun game. Then he tells her that he will answer her honestly and that his goal is to monitor her. Then we see Miranda being upset and saying that Leolishi will destroy the city when she knows that. 
Then Faye tells her that Miranda wants to know who she really is and what her goal is. Leo Lishi tells him that she knew all of that, but she wanted to ask him to know if he would lie to her or not. But he didn't lie to her, so he is a good human. She liked him from the beginning, and if she didn't like him, she wouldn't bother asking that question. Then she puts her hands on the table and tells him that she will call him by Faye and asks him to call her Lishi, because there is no need for nicknames. These games won't be fun if there is a distance between them. So Faye asks her how she can be so friendly to him, to such an extent. She tells him that he has achieved the capabilities of this game, and throws six cards in front of him, telling him that the cards she collected are dreams, hobbies, and the origin. So the nature of this real game is that even if you know the location of the water card, you don't take it, because it's not the same game as the original game where the goal is to get more pairs. Then Faye draws the name card and tells her that he shouldn't take this name card because he already knows her name and since he doesn't get another turn after getting a pair, he would waste his turn entirely because of the additional rule where he always compares the cards he recalls with the information he wants. So this is the game of information. Then Layla she asks him what he intended to ask her if he got the two blank cards. So Faye asks her why she stays here instead of returning to Elements and also why she chose him when there are many messengers much more skilled than him. Leia Lishi approaches him and tells him that he is the only beginner who has achieved three consecutive victories. So even in the past century, only a few beginners have been heard comparing to that. She wants to end the games with him and came down to this world because she wants to play with humans. But it turns out to be a one-way trip from elements to the material world. So she can't return because she is a devil. Faye gets angry and ask her if she really has to use that sentence here. Leah Lishi tells him that all she has to do is play monster games, which means she will achieve 10 victories in monster games, and after that she can return because she is a devil. Faye asks Leah Lishi if she knows what celebration and reward they will receive for winning the monster games. Leah Lishi tells him that the monsters will grant them one wish, but they are not entirely wrong as they can then get 100 or 1,000 wishes or any number they want. Faye asks her precisely how generous they are. Leolishi takes him by the hand because he finds himself in front of the gateway to the other world located in the immersion center at the secondary office of the mystery agency. Leolishi tells him that she couldn't wait any longer. She has been waiting to find a human like him for a long time. Then she grabs his hand, and they enter the gateway, stepping into the spiritual nominal world. We see that huge monster in the city, and the game is announced to begin. And so ends the first episode of this wonderful anime. To follow the upcoming episodes, you can subscribe to the channel and activate the notification bell to receive updates. Hello, this is Tanjiro Recaps channel for summarizing the world of anime. I hope you enjoy watching. Let's now continue with the new episode of the wonderful anime The Irregular at Magic High School Season 3. Our episode begins with the girl talking about superpowers that can either change the world for the better or destroy entire nations. It's all about the power of change in this era where stereotypes are challenged. Those who use magic were once known as sorcerers, but now, almost a century later, the descendants of those sorcerers are known as blood mages. Among them is the powerful Yotsuba family ruling over 10 major clans. For me, it's a significant curse. Today is November 6, 2095 ad, and we see the girl in that house with the man. She's very afraid, but he reassures her saying, don't worry, my dear, we're not who we were three years ago. The man with her is her brother. She then sits down and recalls her relationship with him. The scene shifts to April 6, 2096 ad, the first day of the school year. We see the siblings walking together when Erica, the girl with colorful hair, greets them. She talks to them, asking Tatsuya about his feelings wearing the formal uniform for Subject 1. He responds, don't make fun of me, Erica. But tell me, do you feel comfortable in that magical geometry outfit? Tatsuya tells them it may be a new uniform, but it's just a title now. Another person interrupts, saying, don't argue, you fools. As for the girl with glasses, her name is Mizuki. The scene shifts again to inside the school where Tatsuya sits and talks with Erika and her friend. They discuss trivial matters until they are interrupted by a handsome boy with brown eyes, who introduces himself as Haganai. He greets them, pleased to meet them. Tatsuya thinks to himself that Haganai is independent from the Tomitsuka family, one of the strongest families known as Level Zero. It's unexpected that such a powerful boy is here. Erika then asks Haganai about his ranking of five in their class, and how he joined the magical engineering department. 
Haganai explains that it's closer to his family's specialty, where each person joins and works in their respective field. And he also admits to a flaw when it comes to practical skills. Then Tatsuya speaks to himself, saying that the level zero title isn't just about his strong affinity for unassailable long-range magic, but also signifies pride in using remote magic. He then addresses them, telling each person their strengths and weaknesses. His friend agrees that this talk is convincing when it comes from him. At that moment, the red-haired girl enters and says, Found you, boy. Her name is Akichi. She greets everyone saying good morning and appears to be a bit annoying as she talks a lot. Hagenai leaves, and the annoying girl follows him again. The scene shifts to the student council office, where the yellow-haired girl informs them that they'll form the student council and discipline committee for the first half of 2096. She announces the new members, as Shadowa Shiba as the newly appointed vice president of the student council, Yoshida and Miss Kaidem as the newest members of the discipline committee. They stand up and she welcomes them, expressing their eagerness to work together. Then the leader tells them that today they will discuss their plans for the entrance ceremony after tomorrow, meaning the next class representative for this year will also participate. She mentions someone's imminent arrival, and at that moment the awaited person Takuma Shibuo, the next class representative for this year, enters. Everyone welcomes him, and he asks about the emblem. The other girl tells him it's the emblem of the magical engineering curriculum, founded a year ago. He looks at Mizuki and is surprised, but we don't know why he did that. The scene then shifts to Mizuki sitting with her brother, and he says he didn't expect animosity and hostility from the start. He believes Shaibu wants to prove that he has powers worthy of the ten major clans, leading to a tendency to look down on those without powers. He told her that in the best cases, the most well-connected individuals were those who had links to magical high schools. She couldn't deny that Shibo, who was just a recent high school graduate, had acted poorly and his actions would eventually cause a rift. The next day was the entrance ceremony for the top high school affiliated with the National Magic University. All students and attending parents were required to gather in the assembly hall where they saw Tatsuya wandering around the school. Sagusa called out to him and Tatsuya welcomed her. She asked if he helped new students, but it had been less than a month since he graduated, and she almost didn't recognize him in his new magical engineering school uniform, completely different from the previous year. She told him that only his official uniform had changed. She refuted his statement and said that everything had changed. He seemed much freer than last year. Tatsuya didn't notice because one can't discern the changes in oneself. Tatsuya replied that she had changed a lot too. Now, she was a college student and seemed very mature like a different person. The girl was embarrassed by his words and asked what he meant by her being different. Tatsuya told her he didn't mean anything specific. It was just talk. The girl got angry, wanting to hit him, but her sister rushed to him to stop anything from happening to him. She tried to hit him but couldn't, so he grabbed her by the foot and threw her to the ground. However, she used her strength to prevent harm. Her sister rushed to her to make sure she was okay, finding her very angry at Tatsuya, thinking he wanted to hurt her sister. Sagusa approached her sister and asked her to calm down. Nothing happened to her, and Sagusa apologized to her friend Tatsuya for her younger sister's behavior, then asked her sister to apologize to him as well, which she did. Tatsuya said to them, I knew from the beginning that you were planning to stop before the injury occurred. Tatsuya's sister then approached Sagusa and asked, what brought you here today? Segusa replied, I'm actually here to take care of my sister, and she asked her siblings to welcome Miss Miyuki. We see Izumi looking at Miyuki, impressed by her appearance. Izumi greets Miyuki and says, I had the honor of witnessing your heroic deeds during the Nine Schools competition. You were incredibly amazing. But seeing you in person, compared to watching you from the stands, you're a hundred times more beautiful. I can't believe I attend the same school as someone like you. I'm extremely excited, Izumi asks Mayuki to be her elder sister, surprising everyone with a request. Miyuki's sister then says, Manami, I think it's impossible for you to become the younger sister of my elder sister. You can accompany my younger sister with my elder brother. If my elder sister marries my brother, then you can accompany my elder brother Tatsui illegally. Izumi becomes upset, saying, I oppose the idea of my elder sister marrying Tatsuya. Kasumi, along with Segusa, requests to marry him, seeing it as a golden opportunity for Miyuki to become her elder sister. Segusa becomes upset and hits them, 
then apologizes to Tatsuya and Miyuki for her sister. Tatsuya tells her, this doesn't bother us at all. Miyuki tells her not to let it bother her, and she takes her sisters away, promising to make it up to them later. Then she says, how is the process of recruiting the best boys going? Her friend responds, he declined the opportunity to join the student council. She heard that he said he wants to dedicate his time to club activities. Since there's something else he wants to do, we have to go along with that. His friend adds, yes, we can't force him. Mayuki says it will be more constructive to think about who will recruit instead of Shibo. She found someone. What about adding Minami to the council? Tatsuya tells her that will be difficult for Minami, as the top student always requests to join the student council. We need to choose an alternative candidate based on their scores in the entrance exam. Miyuki says Shibo, those two were numbers one, two, and three with a slight difference. Erika intervenes with Nakajo, the boy and the girl, asking them what they are doing here. Erika informs them that the disciplinary committee and the extracurricular activities union also want to explore students, and they don't want any conflict with the student council, so they came to consult with her. The girl responds that, of course, the extracurricular activities union wants to recruit Shibo, but it would seem like we are stealing him from the student council. Nakajo tells her that we've already declined, so we won't consider it stealing and he thanks her profusely. The boy tells her not to worry about it, reassuring her. Then Erica asks what the student council will do next. She tells her that since they all seem qualified, there's no need to complicate things. You've irritated the top student and rejected everything. All you have to do is choose the number two student. That's it, this year they'll be surprised by the top student. The next day we see the students gathered by the sea, and Izumi asks if they will appoint one of them as a student council member. Tatsuya tells her that if they are motivated, they will accept both. Miss Kasumi is angry, saying she doesn't intend to join the student council. Miyuki asks Miss Izumi to join the student council instead, making Izumi very happy. Kasumi asks this girl about the secret of not joining the discipline committee. She says, I'm confident you won't be any less useful than Shiba was last year. On the other hand, we see these two girls targeting this boat, observing who comes out of it. Another man emerges from the boat and one of them says, I heard this man is a journalist strongly opposed to institutions. Then these two sisters activate a certain spell, and one of them jumps onto the boat, confronting the villains and starting to knock them down one by one through very powerful moves. No one can touch her. She's incredibly fast. Then she exits the boat, capturing what's happening on her mobile phone. The men on the boat were members of a humanitarian organization operating under the UN. However, the journalist brought them here, and she found messages between him and a senator known for his hatred of magicians. The sister says, it seems we need to investigate more about his background. On the other side, we see this boy named Jin. On the other side, we see this boy named Gungjin. He tells his master that unfortunately, the attack on the progressive human front beach tower has failed and all our men have been captured. This greatly angers his master. Gungjin explains that their role was only to assist them, and our main goal was to control the media. Despite capturing the journalist, progress is moving rapidly, with a 40 advancement in visual media and around 30 in print media, I believe. The demon says once we reach 50 control of visual media, unleash all capabilities so that no politician seeking votes can succeed. At this point, we notice that the demon's eyes dim signaling the end of our episode today. Stay tuned for upcoming episodes with very exciting events, but we ask you to subscribe to the channel and activate the notification bell to receive all the latest updates. Hello, this is Tanjiro Recaps channel for summarizing the world of anime. I hope you enjoy watching. Let's now continue with a new episode of the wonderful anime that time I got reincarnated as a slime season three. The anime begins with Roro says that when he participated in the Alps, he defeated the Climan and was officially named as a demon. King thus becoming part of the OS Lord Octogram Demons of the Eight Stars. And he says that Lion and Valentine left as soon as the conference ended shortly after that, Guy organized a dinner for those who stayed. And when he looks at the food, he doesn't feel so firm about this tiger meat. But when he eats Rimuru, it becomes completely amazed, saying that the meat falls apart on the tongue and the sauce covers it very well. He already calls Raphael to learn the recipe, and when he looks to the side, he realizes that maybe he doesn't need to worry about good manners while they are there, and when he sees Mylan almost drinking something alcoholic. He asks her to stop, 
but she says that that is just the reward for pretending to be manipulated. And then one of them asks why she hasn't stopped pretending to be manipulated yet because Cayman never opened up to who she was manipulating. But she says which in fact it was a good chance to fight with Himuro. But he doesn't even give her any idea about her talk, saying that she is not old enough to drink that. But she says that he is being mean. After all, she is the oldest demon lord there. Despite her appearance takes Loli's car is 800 years old, so everyone starts praising the cognate they are drinking. And when they talk about Valentine, they think that she would definitely like to drink that. So Himro thinks that there were a lot of things he wanted to ask her. But how did she he left? Then Raphael talks to him saying that he managed to analyze all the dishes from that meal, saying that now they can recreate the complete banquet and in addition to getting some of the best dishes in the world, the Alper ended without many problems and with that he returned to Tempest. So the city was very calm with everyone living their daily lives. But when they see Roro, they all make a corridor kneeling in front of him and Hero in turn is embarrassed asking if they rehearsed for this in this rigored and Diablo go to him to salute him for having succeeded come back from the banquet in full. But the first thing Roro asks is what Diablo is doing there but Rigard asks him to calm down. After all, he must be exhausted and after they go to rest, someone knocks on the door wanting to talk to Roro and one of the goblins brings putting Demata to them. And she says that even though she is not that good in the kitchen. She is improving to please them all in the meantime. Voldora asks if she also brought it for him, and she says that she certainly separated his share. But Diablo also gives her another portion, saying that this is payment for their agreement. Then Ramuro asks if Diablo wouldn't eat, but he says that this is payment for the information he gave him and connecting the dots. He then looks at Veldora and he tries to hide it, and Roro finally understands how Diablo knew everything that was decided in the warehouse. He immediately asks about the desserts he would have sold, and ends up agreeing that there were three but Roro is curious. After all, Veldor doesn't even need to eat, but Veldora asks him not to confuse things, because it's not a question of whether he needs it or not, eat he wants to eat. He says that besides, Ramiro doesn't need to eat either. But even so, he's eating it. Diablo remembers that Exio was accompanying Ramuro during that meeting, she says. Yes, she proved that Ramuro doesn't need him while he had her, and Sean leaves it aside, asking if he managed to complete the task that Himuro gave him. He just laughs, saying that he completed it perfectly. But Ruro says he can't understand how he managed to come back at such exact time. But Diablo says he was taking care of other things. But Voldora contacted him and advised him to return, and with that Voldora starts to tremble and wants to leave. But Roro holds him back, giving him a rather terrifying massage. So he shouts telling the dragon not to disturb the work of others. And so he takes the pudding from his hand, saying that there are no sweets for Vodora from now on. And then he tells Haruna that Voldora is going to be without dessert. For a while and with that, Voldora starts calling Ramiro cruel. And then he is all cowered in a corner and Himiro asks Diablo. If it's not a problem that he's wasting time there and Shin even makes fun of him saying that there's nothing better for a butler than serving tea, but Diablo says he doesn't need that. After all, his informant is already acting for him. He says that to begin with. He transformed, they returned to their original form, and he says he did it because it was inconvenient to leave them with pieces of meat and Ruro wonders what he's talking about. But he soon remembers this subject and Diablo says that Sean really is a troublemaker while looking to a box full of pieces of people. He says that even healing magic won't work for those people. So he's going to have to take somewhat drastic measures and ask them to hold on, and after a session of a lot of screaming, one of those in the other carriage wonders. Those three arrived in one piece, but one of them says that they weren't in one piece since they left. So while one of them starts to thank Diablo, he talks to the other wanting to fix him too. But the same man tells him to fix the king. First, him and Diablo remembers him being Hezen, one of the prisoners. He tells the prisoner that he must know that asking him for a favor has a very high price, and the prisoner in turn remembers him saying that he is nor one of the seven primordial demons. But he says that the scariest thing is that this demon serves someone, and he remembers Himuro talking to Sean, realizing that he is a demon lord who has a hidden power that, although fleeting, surpasses imagination, and he says that at that moment he ended up realizing that the kingdom of FMF awakened a sleeping lion and soon after Reimer left, he met Shin's wrath. So the prisoner starts asking Diablo to accept him as his lowest ranking servant, in which he starts 
trying to bargain, trying to ask for the life of the their king, and so Diablo even accepts. But he says that he will no longer tolerate any more respect towards Himuro-sama. And he says that if he notices any kind of hostility towards Rimuru, not only will the king's life end, but he will see the breath of life disappear from the land of Mur itself. So he accepts swearing, total loyalty in the bishop, who was there with them also accepts this, and the king, who is in pieces, starts to remember Sean scolding him, because because of them Roro's hand was soiled with human blood. He realizes that Heisen's decision was probably the right one, and he himself speaks like the last king of Ovi, who swears to cooperate in any way to stay on Diablo's side, and Diablo says that as long as he obeys him, he will treat him well. After all, with his unique tempting ability, no one can betray him. He doesn't start calling a low asking if the prisoners are alive, he tells him not to worry. After all, the mission of taking over a country is trivial compared to everything else, and when he arrives at the palace, they notice that no magic can bring the king back, and they ask what is happening, and Shogo says that to protect the king, he cooperated with a great hero to escape, and not even that he says that it is not Shogo but rising, and everyone starts asking various things about what would have happened until someone asks, everyone to calm down and first listen to what Ryan has to say. Then he speaks. Everyone starts to ask if they all disappeared, and if it would be true, and with that, he says that his army's battle against the monsters has awakened a sleeping dragon. But they say that the Holy Church of the West said that the dragon was destroyed, and Ryan says that it really was destroyed. But even so, the concept of the dragon does not die. He says that the dragon is simply reborn in another place in the world, and he says who didn't expect him to return so soon, or that a place would appear so close to them. And he says that with Vildora's return, all the knights and monsters in that area disappeared. He says that they were the only ones to return. So Yom enters the room. But one of them starts asking who let these commoners enter the room. But Ryan says that they were the ones who saved them. And so the archbishop asks to be able to explain what happened. And he says that when the armies met the battle, that Clody was very intense, and he says that they, they had a numerical advantage, but the monsters knew the region better than them, and because of this, many of their men were lost. He says that the sea that followed must have been the key to Vora's resurrection. So with the destruction of the dragon, they begin to invent a story that someone stopped in front of them to save them. That someone was the leader of the monsters, Himuro-sama, they keep inventing a story, putting Himuro as if he were a hero who saved them all and then asks if Himuro managed to talk to the dragon. They say that having even the slightest contact with the dragon's strong magic is death for almost every type of living organism. He says that, as he should know, Ramuro is the leader of all the moans in the forest. He swears, but they ask you if it wasn't. The false title that he himself gave to be, and with that Ryan starts to tremble. After all, Diablo is there listening to everything. He says that certainly not. After all, he himself saw the city of monsters, and he says that it was certainly truly worthy of being called of capital of a nation. And he says that even the Dryads, the guardians of the great Jurassic Forest, serve him, and he says that it was through the Adrad that Himuro managed to negotiate with Veldora. So they realize that he controls even the Dryads. They say they are so powerful. Surely they won't want to have him as an enemy. So Yom asks him to calm down. And after all, he worked with Hymer when he defeated the Lorderer. Then he says that Hymer is very friendly and wants to live in harmony with humans. So he starts saying that he can serve as a mediator and convey your demands to him. Masum says he is friendly in normal situations, but not now. After all, they declared war on Hymer's nation. And he says that that was definitely a bad idea. Some of Hamuro's friends died because of it. However, that same annoying guy starts to say that if he has influence with Roro, he must fulfill their purposes. He says that it is his duty as a great hero to mediate for them, and in the meantime, Diablo is pissed off after them. But the man starts to say that they sent people from another world to make a mess in their house. He went there to try to make peace and fix the SNTS-7 ZZ. And they did, and the man even tries to continue arguing, but Risen ends up freezing him, saying that he has no idea about what they went through. Then, they were straight to the point that everything Yom said is true. They were defeated and the only survivors were the three of them, and the king was like that after finding the Vidora particles. Mm, and they are in shock with this discovery. And without having a lot to do, they end up agreeing with Yom and Diablo says that this was a very wise decision and now committed. 
He is going to free the king of this nation, and they ask who he is while threatening him. He ends up saying that he is Rimuro's butler. This while throws a healing potion on the king. They ask what that is, and he says that it is one of his nation's specialties, the best healing potion the world has ever seen. And after healing the king, he says that he has a hero message for this nation, and he says that in a week, representatives of our nations will come together on this land to discuss peace. And he says that he will give you options, option one being the king, abdicating the throne and you pay compensation, option two. You surrender to our nation and become a vassal state in option three. The war continues and Diablo says these are the options he wants to know. The answer in a week, but the nobles start saying that a week is too little time. But Diablo says that it doesn't matter. After all, their problems don't interest Ramuro. And he also tells them not to try any tricks if they don't respond for a week. It means that the war continues, and with that they understood the message well, and Diablo tells Roro that that's what he he asks if he showed them that, and he deduces that that was the best way to intimidate them. He says that as compensation he asked for 10,000 stellar gold coins, and Roro asks if he's not asking for too much, but Diablo says he gave three choices to them, being that continuing the war is impossible given that his army was destroyed, and it is obvious that his nobles are opposed to Poro becoming the vassal state. So he says that there is only one choice left for them, and that would be to negotiate. So Orr suggests that they pay 10 years or if they don't try other terms. But Diablo says that the kingdom of FMF will have no choice but to accept his terms. But they will try to place the blame on third states, and after all this plan, he will end up not being able to use the currency because Estelaire gold coins cannot be accepted due to their exorbitant value, and the third party who will be held responsible will probably be the king now that his royal knights are gone, is to join Holmes' faction and let him control everything. So Diablo says that his deduction is completely correct, and he says that they just need to lend some forces to Yom and Roro asks if that would work. After all, the next king could end up joining forces with the neighboring nations, but he says that the neighboring nations are busy gathering their own influence. So that wouldn't happen. But even if it happens, Diablo says he will take care of it personally. And Ruro says that this is excellent and will leave everything up to him, telling him to get in touch. If it happens something and Diablo is very happy with it. And morally a lot happened. And I'm sure this season is going to be very good. I hope there are 25 episodes and I want to see a lot of Decenfriol and I want to see how far he goes. So if you want more episodes, leave a like, subscribe and I'll stay here. I'll see you in the next video. Hello, this is Tanjiro Recaps channel for summarizing the world of anime. I hope you enjoy watching. Let's now continue with a new episode of the wonderful anime Salad Bowl of Eccentrics. Susuke Kabaria, an impoverished detective, meets Sarah, a princess from another world with magical powers. They start living together and Sarah quickly adjusts her life to modern Japan. Two girls run frantically through the territory of the Ophim Empire, set in the former Demon King's castle, until Livia Diudes draws her blade to deal with assailants. She holds them off and ushers Princess Sarah de Odin to run. And when the attackers approach, Livia fights back with her pride in the Yudis family's long history of defending the Imperial family. Nevertheless, she somewhat botched blowing Sarah's cover, since the assailants were unaware. At first, she was the princess. However, it didn't matter because Livia showed off her skill by unleashing a barrage. Sarah ran until she reached the portal leading to a different world, her destination. And even though it appeared risky, she leaped straight in, starting her Isekai journey. Next, we relocate to the Gifu Prefecture's Gifu City a location that flourished as Oda Nobunaga's residence during the Sengoku period. Since then, it has blended into the background of the city. So Kekaraya, a 29-year-old detective in the city, is both unremarkable and ordinary. He claimed that's not me. The office worker Koji Takemoto is his current target. His spouse is the client. She believes he is having an affair since he has been acting strangely for the past few months. After three days of following him, Sokse is hoping to catch something soon. As he chases his target, a portal opens above Soka, allowing Princess Sarah Shees to emerge. She is only slightly taken aback by the sight of another world and apologizes equally mildly for landing on this man. Oh no, Sosuke is taken aback by the girl. Without showing any empathy, he lost his target and gashed his hand. She tells Sosuke not to worry about a small cut on his body. As she applies a light touch to heal it, and after dabbing away the blood, he's shocked 
to see that the wound is healed completely. Relaxing on a park bench following a conversation with Suki, Sarah is aware that she has been transported to a world devoid of magic. She introduces herself to Soke as the seventh princess of the Ophium Empire, which fled to this world after being overthrown by a rebellion. The fact that she healed his hand made him believe her isekai story without any difficulty. But she questions how she managed to speak Japanese, thinking maybe she was given a translation spell as she went through. The entryway, when she asks if she can use any magic besides healing, Sosuke must not have expected her to blow up a playground structure right away. That was only a taste of her specialty magic attack. She declares with pride, and she could easily summon explosions even bigger than this. But Sosuke grabs her and drags her away while yelling at her, telling her they must leave. She needs to get over her fantasy sensibilities if she hopes to reside in this nation. Livia eventually drove the assailants away when she returned to the Ophium Empire and used the portal to follow her princess in this novel world. It appears to be very different from the Empire in her opinion. When she approaches a couple to ask for assistance, they start yelling. She discovers a reflection of herself and whoopsie blood all over her. So after taking a nice bath, she eats some fish that she caught in the Niger River. If you want to fish, you need a permit, so don't do what she did. While savoring her fish, she notices Gifu Castle and assumes it is the nation's castle. She hopes to petition the Lord there and ask for Rain's assistance, then abruptly collapses, forcing her to seek refuge under a bridge. After our meeting with the bridge hobo Suzuki, we head to Susuke's house, also known as the Kabaraya Detective Agency, where Sarah is enjoying some noodles and Susuke is attempting to decide what to do with her. When Sarah questions him about his work, she finds out that he is a private investigator who searches for people, runs background checks, and does a lot of other tasks. Sarah thinks his work is similar to that of a shinobi, but how is ninja's hell known to someone from a fantasy world? He wants her out by tomorrow, so let her stay for the night. She agrees, but upon her departure, she will have to erase his memories. However, it's not as simple as erasing her from his mind. He would probably lose memories spanning several weeks to years. In the worst case, he might turn into a total vegetable. The icing on the cake is that she has never attempted the spell before. To put it mildly, Sosuke was not at all excited by this. He asked her why she felt the need to erase his memories in the first place. To which she responded that she might become a guinea pig if the scientists or intelligence services in this nation discovered that she could use magic. This makes perfect sense. Sarah tells him smugly, that Susix are seen in science fiction films. What will it be then? Will you expel me? Back under the bridge for the time being, forcing him to reluctantly take her in. Livia is taken aback to learn that Gifu Castle is empty, even though it's only a museum that has been meticulously restored to resemble the original Gifu Castle. Suzuki gives her a cardboard bed to sleep on and wake up in. That was the best sleep she's had in a long time, she exclaims. Suzuki is surprised by this because considering the trucks that pass by even at night, perhaps she is suited for being homeless. Regaining Sussex's place, the two have eggs, rice, and natto for a cheap breakfast. Meanwhile, Sosuke has to listen to the news about an explosion that occurred in a park in Gifu City last night at around 8 p.m. The police are looking into whether the explosion was intentional or the result of an accident. Sarah laments that there isn't enough food in this world as she eats, but Sosuke has the 13-year-old culprit eating in front of him. But Sosuke warns her not to interpret his food as a metaphor for this world. Many families eat far healthier. Sarah questions why their diet isn't better. Are private investigators truly paid so little? In order to cope, Sosuke says that while wealthy detectives do exist, they typically collaborate with large teams of people. And he's on his own here which means that he can only take on a certain amount of work and doesn't make enough money to hire anyone else. He has a few savings and a few loyal customers. He simply can't help but spoil visitors like Sarah afterwards. Sarah's given some clothes by the people who run the cafe downstairs, and she uses the library to study while having a great time playing phone games. After seven days in a row of unsuccessfully tailing Koji, Sosuke texts Sarah and, after threatening to send her to hell, wins her back. She's eager to eat some bentos that are discounted. She is reading manga when he gets home. She appears to have adapted well to life in Japan. Right now it's Detective Conan, whoa. She finds pleasure in the entertainment provided by this world, but she finds it difficult to get over the infrequent meals, as Sosuke claims. If things go well at my current job, 
Hey, I'll take her out to a nice meal. Sarah becomes quite excited about this, and even though Sosuke is unsure of when the work will be finished, Sarah offers to assist, although Sarah obviously has more than that. Sosu is unaware of how explosion magic could be of assist. How about using magic to vanish or fly? Well, those aren't just sensible. They're outright frauds in this world. But he rejects her because he doesn't want a child like her to have to deal with an affair. Sarah, however, doesn't see anything wrong with this. She's a concubine's daughter. Why is he only taking cases involving infidelity? Why exactly isn't he solving cases like real-life detectives like Detective Conan? Avoid handling complicated cases. Sarah was just pondering how awesome Soki's private eyes are when he recalls quitting his job to pursue his dream of becoming a great detective. To so say, true private eyes aren't heroes. At one point, he desired to pursue justice. Another day, Sosuke discovered Koji at a restaurant. Koji had withdrawn a large sum of money after getting off at a new stop. Does he meet his partner in this place? Then, out of nowhere, Koji receives a call, and Soke follows after him. They arrived at an abandoned structure where Koji gives some dubious, seeking for money from men and being rejected observing the happening. Soke believes it is evident. Koji is constantly being blackmailed for money by those guys. Then he observes as the men begin abusing Koji. Initially, Sosuke believes that he should just call the police and wait. But then he recalls Sarah's comment about how great she thought private eyes were. He observes himself entering going up to the men. At first, he gives the justification that he was searching. The lavatory and mentions after that. Perhaps they shouldn't have killed the man, but Sose ought to have anticipated someone brandishing a baseball bat from the side. Fortunately, the thug and the other men are shot against a wall and stopped in midair. It appears that Sarah is on the case and she is quite happy to have been following him. The thugs want to know who she is, but she says it doesn't matter. She's just a fantastic investigator stopping by. Outside, she appears to be a cute girl. On the inside, she possesses a demon's strength and a sharp mind. Sarah is known as the great detective by the Lord people, but Sosuke notes that no detective boasts of their weaponry. Sarah remembers Sosuke telling him that true heroes aren't real private eyes and urging him to become one himself. Then one of the thugs charges at them out of nowhere, but Sosue easily defeats him using the Russian martial art of Sistema, which causes Sarah to become ecstatic before she explodes. The remaining thugs, and she informs them when they challenge her authority, because an expert like her can destroy enemies with just key. She used Chinese martial arts, which is the magic power she's hiding. Naturally, the thugs then launch a simultaneous charge, but Sarah easily overcomes them and ties them up that evening. When Sosuke serves some exquisite beef for supper, Sarah is blown away by how good the meat is. She tells him she's joining him on cases, even though he still doesn't want her to because she wants to eat delicious food. Thus, Sosuke and Princess Sarah's detective partnership was established. Okay, so that was a fun way to begin this anime. Please subscribe to my channel and like this video in order to watch next week's episode, but for now, check out the following video.